Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is the final lecture in the Center for Evolutionary Medicine series for this term. We're so glad to have you all, and we're especially glad to have Paul Griffiths with us. Before I introduce him properly, I'll mention that we have a big celebration coming up, opening our labs. Monday, December 4th, Bert is going to give a well, words of welcome to the lab at 3.15. You should be all on the email list with details. Please RSVP and join us for the big opening of our, our laboratories. So I've been following Paul Griffith's work for a long time. He wrote a book with the Woody Allen title, uh, edited book, um, Sex and Death, <laughs> and it is as interesting as the title suggests. Um, he's been one of the world leaders in biological philosophy for ever since he started his career, really. And he hasn't just done one little thing, uh, but one thing he has kept coming back to repeatedly is what's normal, what's not. Are there ways of saying something about uh, what is disease and, and what's not that can be informed both by philosophy and so sociological and cultural definitions and by biological ones? And how can we get past the old useless arguments about all of this? He's an Australian National Research uh, Fellow and is extremely distinguished in terms of all kinds of support he's gotten. He's a fellow of the American Association of Science. And of science. I'm going to read you here about his project, which has two and a half million dollars of funding, uh, is to develop a new theory of health and disease to accommodate developments in contemporary biolo biology. Uh, the project will conduct methodologically innovative research in philosophy of medicine, trying to create an integrative biomedical research, really going quite beyond some of the simplistic kinds of approaches that we see sometimes. Um, he's also interested in ethical aspects of evolution and medicine mm -hmm. and deeper questions, but I'm not going to go on about all of this. I'll let him go on and tell you. <laughs> Paul, we're so glad you're here. Hey. Thanks very much, Randy. Yeah. Well, and thanks very much for the invitation to spend some time here. Um, I have, I wouldn't say I've learnt a great deal about uh, population genetics in the last two days here. I've learnt a great deal of what I don't know about population genetics and what I probably ought to, so that was kind of more useful. Um, okay, so the title of this talk comes from a throwaway remark from Tim Lewins, who's a professor of history and philosophy of science at Cambridge and a noted bioethicist. Um, amongst, he's a philosopher of science, but he's, he's also very well known for his bioethics stuff. And this book, The Biological Base of Bioethics, uh, Tim is discussing the ideas about how we define disease, draw a distinction between the normal and the pathological. And he says, as a criticism of evolutionary approaches, that they make pathology a hostage to evolutionary inquiry. He thinks there's a real problem. There are things that are just, you know, anybody can see are pathological and if this accountant is right, one day an evolutionist might come along and tell you some incredibly obscure things about evolution, and suddenly that wouldn't be pathological anymore. And he thinks that's, that's kind of crazy, um, that couldn't be right. Um, whereas I think, uh, when I read that, I thought, well, hell yes, it should be pathology to evolutionary, it should, it should be hostage to evolutionary inquiry. Um, what And Randy's written a couple of papers, in fact, in which you've said, basically, you know, yes, you can't just pull the definition of disease out of evolution, sure. But the idea that that's not a fundamentally relevant body of information, when you look at a phenotype and ask, is that phenotype something we should think about as pathological, um, is kind of crazy. OK, so the sterile old debate that Randy briefly mentioned, we have uh, uh, the, the <coughs> um, sort of convention, conventional positions uh, we've got people who think that the notion of pathology is entirely normative. Um, great French philosopher Georges Canguilhem up there, um, and a little friend of mine from Ireland, um, Shane Glackin, who's an excellent philosopher with misguided views on this topic. Um, and uh, in the middle, sorry, on the far side, we've got uh, Christopher Bourse, who's about the only guy in the world who thinks uh, you can define what a disease is without any reference to social context or values, um, or for that matter, evolution, um, except in a very minimal way. You just need population statistics. Um, and then in the middle, there are people we all uh, probably know, uh, Jerome Wakefield and Karen Neander at Duke, um, who uh, maintain that roughly that they want to think about the realm of the pathological as the realm of the things that are in an objective sense biologically dysfunctional and where we care. Plenty of things are biologically dysfunctional and we don't care. Um, for example, vasectomies, 
Okay? Clearly the male reproductive tract is not in its finest possible functional state, but we don't think it's pathological because we don't have a problem with it not being in its finest pathological state. Uh, vice versa, um, we uh, intervene to get our nose made into a cuter shape. I suppose I'm Silvio Berlusconi, you know, I'm going in for my 85th bit of plastic surgery. Um, okay, there's plenty of disvalue. I really hate the way I look, and so do most people in Italy, but there's no real objective biological dysfunction going on. So the idea is the intersection is the interesting place to be. Now, surprisingly, uh, as I say, there's possibly one guy in the universe out there there's a few people in here, and most people in conventional philosophy of medicine are over in the, the um, complement of that little intersection out here, which is kind of surprising. So here's a, a kind of nice statement. Uh, Congiem, uh, if you don't, many of you will know, those you don't, uh, he was the guy who taught Michel Foucault how to be a historian of science, so he's not exactly an insignificant figure in intellectual history. Um, and uh, he wrote a magisterial book. He's a, a former uh, his doctor, but he also had a lot of interest in diabetes research when he was young. It's a very well-informed book. He wrote this magisterial work, which is effectively a history of how 19th century scientific physiology came to characterize the concept of the pathological. And just like someone like Foucault, the history is written in such a way as to slowly lead you towards some kind of big philosophical conclusions. And one of the big philosophical conclusions um, is structures, can, he says, can be objectively described, but they cannot be called pathological on the strength of some purely objective criteria. And in fact, most of the arguments for this purely normative view of pathology in the contemporary philosophy literature, in my view, um, are better, uh, are there in, in a kind of subtler, more aware of the pitfalls kind of way in Congium. I'm not sure there's much, much new under the sun there. The idea is, suppose we pick a phenotype, which might be the phenotype is having a particular problem with regulating your glucose metabolism, all right? And we can decide that that's a pathological phenotype then we can objectively characterize what it is. So there's lots of objective med medical knowledge. But the fact that that's medical knowledge is not something we derive from the realm of objective fact. It's a prior decision we make based on the fact that this is something that we would like to change. Okay, so the distinction between normal and pathological phenotypes is entirely normative. Um, it, it's a matter of what the individual and their society want. And in Congiem's particular treatment, which is still incredibly popular, um, uh, uh, as I discovered when I've given these talks to philosophy audiences, the, uh, there's no arguing with the patient's demand to be helped. Okay, that's kind of the ultimate ground of all judgments of pathology, is patients coming and demanding help. Uh, being French philosopher, Congiem has a much cuter way of putting that. He says, you know, the, the doctor is called by the patient. That's the great Congiem slogan, right? So the, the, the idea that within all of the biological sciences, there's a subset of those which are studying pathology as opposed to normal physiology is ultimately rests on a social fact that there are certain kinds of things that in certain times and places, people come to the doctor wanting something done about. Okay, so widely held view, widely supported, lots of uh, people um, with big reputations um, who've written about how this is the right answer. Um, from my problem is that I come to this as somebody who does philosophy of biology. Uh, my big interest have always been particularly interaction of, well, what do genes do? What, what are the forms of gene action? And how does that figure in explaining development? I mean, that's something I've written about for decades. Um, if you come at this from a general biology perspective, that's a very strange view. It's kind of a plausible view for medicine for human beings, and you might get away with it when you're doing vet science. But in many other areas of biology, it's a very strange view. So let me sort of explain why. So here's what Congiem says about applying the concept of pathology to non-human animals. He says, these notions, he's talking specifically pathology and malady, are, or their French equivalents, are applied to all living beings through sympathetic regression starting from lived human experience. Okay, so... How, what is it conceptually going on when we think of a state in a non-human animal as being pathological? Well, we start with, you know, the doctor is called by the patient, the clinical need for treatment, and we kind of work by analogy to how that would work if that was sort of applicable to animals, 
Okay? Um, now, contrast that, another great thinker of the 1940s, J.B.S. Haldane, in his incredibly seminal, important paper um, on uh, disease and evolution, 1949. This is one of the first papers to really start saying the dynamics we can think about, particularly the dynamics of evolution with parasitism and how it's different from anything that we've studied um, in previous decades. It says the, the author, says Haldane, it's the abstract, the author suggests that the struggle against disease has been a very important evolutionary agent. Some of its results have been rather unlike those of the struggle for life in its common meaning. So Haldane is hinting that the dynamics of evolutionary processes that involve interactions between pathogens and their hosts is going to be distinctive as a realm of evolutionary dynamics. Now, I think the idea that the concept of pathology in general is based on sympathetic regression is kind of weird. And if you combine that with this obvious point that Haldane's making, you'd have to say, actually, our best understanding of a distinctive section of evolutionary dynamics rests on a key theoretical notion that's us simply, you know, now if I was, you know, um, a rose and I had these thrips on me, would I be going to the doctor? I mean, that's just not plausible. That's not what biologists are doing. Um, now, so many basic biological ideas are conceptually linked to the idea of pathology. So we've got a couple of animals that are interacting ecologically. We might want to say this one's a predator of that one. We might want to say that this one is a parasite of that one. If we can't distinguish which phenotypic states of the host species are normal versus those which are pathological, I don't think we're going to be able to distinguish between predating somebody and giving them a nice cuddle and you know, maybe uh, grooming them. We're not going to be able to distinguish between parasitizing somebody and being a symbiont of theirs. Um, concepts like homeostasis and allostasis. If we talk about an organism having a target and failing to meet the target, then we're in the realm of the normative. Okay, you can't. So the whole point about the kind of Kongiemian approach is nature is full of beautiful Darwinian variation. Which of that variation constitutes you know, things like polymorphism or phenotypic plasticity, and what constitutes ad, um, pathology is imposed by society. Okay? And from the Haldane point of view, that's just not going to work. I just like this one because I was happy to be reading this paper on, um, uh, and these are two Japanese scientists, and the question is, we've got a population of locusts, some of whom have short wings. Is this another, as well as the ones we know about, another locust morph, or are these individuals with deformed wings? And they offer a large body of rigorous experimental and observational evidence to distinguish the hypothesis that this is a deformation from the hypothesis that it's a morph. And there's biomechanics, and there's uh, ecology, but there ain't nothing about the values of Japanese society or the values of locust society. And how could there be? All right? Um, OK, so looks as if general biology has a concept of pathology which is not either normative or relative to the society of the speaker or the society the speaker is observing. Now, if we take the kind of normativist line in philosophy of medicine, we're going to end up with the view that when I say um, that uh, you know, Randy is sick and I say that Randy's dog Rex is sick, that's a homonym. That's like walking down the riverbank and going and getting money out of the bank. They're just homonyms. And I put it to you that that is a deeply, deeply implausible position. It's not a position anybody would be comfortable once you state it. Some will always say, oh, no, I don't have to believe that. It's not a position anyone wants to be in. So instead, I want to suggest that we should start from the assumption there's a fundamental unity between human and non-human pathology. So yes, human pathology is probably, if we want to try and understand what's and we have to think about this to get away from semantics. There's a phenomena out there, namely, human beings and other animals are frequently in pathological states. And we have a whole bunch of words for talking about that, and we shouldn't get fussed. Is that, you know, it's disease, disability, um, you know, these are all, yeah, injury. I mean, you know, getting hung up on any of, on the, the, the current English meaning of any of those words is really not helpful. I mean, philosophy no more than science is an exercise in lexicography. We have lexicographers to do lexicography, okay? We should be saying we're trying to understand pathology. Now, it's quite plausible that what's, what's going on in the domain of stuff we talk about in human medicine 
involves a bunch of stuff that we just don't, aren't talking about and don't think about when we deal with non-human animals. It's quite plausible. It's plausible that value considerations are really important in making sense of the discourses of medicine. But that's going to be some kind of elaboration on top of a shared core of what pathology is that applies to both human and non-human cases. Now, how is evolution going to be relative, relevant? It's going to be relevant, I would argue, because evolutionary considerations in many different broad kind of ways give you substantive reasons for thinking that something is pathological. Just like my Japanese locust biologists come along and say, I don't think that's pathological. Look at the biomechanics, look at the ecology. They don't come along and say, you know, I've, just, I've, got, I've got an analysis of the word disease. Turns out that disease means and then some biomechanics and stuff, right? That's not what they do. They say, here are substantive scientific reasons for saying that's not pathological. So that's the role I think evolution is going to play. It's relevant to our understanding of what pathology is, not what the word pathology means. That's not an issue that is tremendously exciting. OK, so here are traditional evolutionary approaches to dysfunction, the ones that are very, very familiar to anybody in philosophy of medicine. Um, a number of people, I mean, this, actually, I must say I have a bit of a beef about this because um, uh, people like to say there's this analysis of what functional language means in biology, which we attribute to um, a guy uh, who just graduated from University of Indiana back in the 70s. Um, what was his name? Goodness sake. Anyway, um, and then to Ruth Millikan, brilliant Connecticut philosopher in 84, and then to Karen Neander in about 83, although she didn't publish until after Millikan. Um, it's, pretend, it's, it's just what in, what's in Colin Petendry's great 1958 paper um, introducing the idea of teleonomy. For the older biologists in the room, we'll no doubt all be familiar with Ernst Myers saying, this notion of teleology is a real problem. Let's introduce a new word, teleonomy, to mean purposive language in biology, which can be fully discharged as just a way of talking about natural selection. Okay, so that was Meyer's line. Colin Petendry was a biologist who wrote this paper in one of Meyer's, you know, kind of, Meyer was a very political biologist, one of Meyer's, you know, collections of, um, you know, the right line about biology, okay? Um, and uh, it's a great, you know, it's a great paper. And he basically says, look, we can understand, you know, for hundreds of years, everybody has said biology is distinctive because it's purposive, it has goal-directedness, it's very different from physics. And... The classic modern synthesis line was, yeah, that's just a way of talking about natural selection. We're going to call it teleonomy to distinguish it from that older idea. Okay? Now, sure, philosophers have elaborated in all sorts of directions, but you know, that approach, which I like to call the selected effect, basically says the functions of a trait, the things that it's, it's for, are simply those effects of the trait in a system for which that trait was selected in the evolutionary past. Many problems with that, but that's the one-liner. OK, and standard line from Wakefield. So when you've got something which is not performing its selected function, and we care, that's when we're going to regard it as a disease or as pathological or whatever it might be. OK? Um, why did he regard it as a non-starter? So um, John Matheson um, uh, was a postdoc with me a few years ago, and I uh, have a paper where we... Uh, Basically, it's, it's the sort of emperor has no clothes paper. Um, it basically says everybody in philosophy of medicine says evolutionary accounts are a non-starter. And if you go through all of the arguments that are offered, most of them show only a passing acquaintance with how evolution explains things. And they're often quite absurd. So, I mean, you won't believe me when I tell you this, but it's God's honest truth. Um, uh, Christopher Bourse is an incredibly well-known guy, much discussed. Uh, Bors has managed to publish and get through referees the following claim. Um, you can't explain uh, what it is to be functioning normally using evolution because we've got a nine-year-old kid and a 14-year-old kid. The normative level of functioning for cognitive stuff is different. And so no, they can't both be the evolutionary optimum level, right? And you're sitting there thinking, you know, have you that got through review somewhere? I mean, it's amazing. Um, so, uh, right. Now, despite the nice things I've just said about selected effects accounts, I think when you start to look at a wider range of biological phenomena, you can see that the notion of dysfunction or impairment of function uh, 
is going to be a lot more complicated than this idea of failing to do what you were designed to do by natural selection. More complicated and more interesting. So this is another paper I wrote with uh, John Matheson, which is just coming out. And we're exploring, quite tentatively, many different kinds of what we call biological normativity. Now, I partly call it biological normativity to be kind of in your face, because lots of people in my discipline think that there's a really big distinction between you know, the realm of description and fact and the realm of norms and, and judgments. Okay? Um, I think that there are many interesting ways in which if you're describing a piece of biology and you don't talk about what's better or worse, then you're actually leaving out bits of the biology. And I think I, want, that's, I hope to show you that's just something you all believe anyway and, and quite straightforward. We perhaps don't quite notice it a lot of the time because it's kind of obvious. So I'm going to talk about biological normativity whenever, in order to just get the biology right, to say what a system is happening or his system is doing or what's happened over a period of change in biology, you've got to talk about one outcome being worse than the other, rank, rank them on some evaluative scale. Okay? All right. So. Um, this is where most accounts fo uh, focus. Um, so uh, one of the referees for that paper uh, said, uh, you know, anything that isn't this isn't really to do with dysfunction at all, right? It's the only thing that, that they're interested in. So this is what we call mechanism failure. So here we've got our poor little DBDB mouse. It's got faulty leptin receptors. It's hyperphagic, right? Um, we take that selected effect to counter dysfunction. Why is that a dysfunctional mouse? Because a little bit in the mouse, okay, a gene coding for a receptor, is broken. Okay, there's a bit of the mouse, it's bust, it can't do what evolution designed it to do because it's physically different from the bits that were selected in the past. Something's happened to it. Okay, so that's mechanism failure, and of course, you know, it doesn't have to be genes, it can be organs, it can be anything you like. So that's a very straightforward notion of something being dysfunctional. Something is dysfunctional if it's broken. Here's another well-known way of being dysfunctional. So uh, we're talking about the appetite system here. The system is mechanistically normal, but it's operating way outside its design parameters. We talk about an obesogenic environment. Um, another nice example, which I originally got from Paul Rosin, the disgust guy, superfoods. Right? We deliberately engineer foods that are nutritional super stimuli, and we eat too much of them for the same reason that the poor little marsh warbler feeds the cuckoo baby. Right? It's got a, this is food with a big yellow gape. And so instead of keeping on stuffing food in the cuckoo, you keep on stuffing food in your mouth. Uh, another way to think about it is a systematically divorcing cue and consequence. So let's hear something that's pure carbohydrate, and my food technology buddies have given it all of the sensory cues for high protein content. Okay. Systems, you know, our systems for, uh, m for evaluating whether we've been intaking the right macro micronutrient groups do not, uh, were not designed to function in those environments, and they don't function well in those environments. Okay? Um, so the selected effects theory, it's not very straight, entirely straightforward. So there's a clear account of what's going on. Ruth Millikan has this very useful neologism. It's abnormal with a big N. And it's to distinguish abnormal from, say, statistically abnormal or abnormal as a value judgment. So abnormal with a big N just means an abnormal environment is an environment that's outside the range of environments in which some system evolved. OK, so that's a little technical sense. In what sense do you say that's an abno abnormal <coughs> environment? I mean it's an ab big N normal. We can look at the uh, environments which set the design parameters for the biological mechanism, and this is outside that range, and that's why we're calling it abnormal. Um, and of course, that gives you an explanation of why features of parts of the organism, uh, mechanisms, don't perform their selected function. And whereas I think Millikan is happy to talk about those mechanisms being dysfunctional when they're in their abnormal environment, um, I'm pretty sure there's a 95 paper, and I haven't seen anything that changes this, that Neander wants to say um, the mechanism isn't dysfunctional in that context. Okay? And that's, again, we could argue about that. I don't really mind which way you go on that. But at least the selected effects theory has something to say about what's going wrong here. 
These guys are in an ab big N normal environment. Uh, just a little point, something which I think nobody's thought about enough. Um, mismatch phenomena happen on multiple time scales. All right? We've got physiological mismatch, we've got ontogenetic mismatch, and we've got phylogenetic mismatch. So if you're looking at something like appetite, you, know, you actually get conditions you want to intervene to fix on all three timescales. So you've got microevolutionary change in nutritional targets, for example. So you've got human subpopulations in which you actually have to reckon that those human subpopulations are adapted to slightly different environments. And so when you move people around, you get mismatch phenomena. Um, and to move them into new health systems, you get mismatch phenomena because the norms, the normative standards that are applied in different health systems are norm for the target population. Okay? Um, ontogenetic, of course, that's the classic mismatch phenomena that people like uh, Peter Guckman, uh, Mark Hansen, and so on write about. But physiological mismatch is also going on. I mean, you've got organisms that are failing to meet a daily intake target for something, okay? um, and then have to correct. So you mismatch on all sorts of, and that might be because they're not on the right diet. Okay, they're on a, a they've got a, they've given a menu of foods according to which it's impossible to get the ratios right to hit a target. Okay, so it's complicated, but it's a it's a perfectly sensible idea. So you might think, with the select, so selected effect counts can distinguish mechanism failure from mismatch. Um, you might think that it's either going to be if if an org, if a mechanism is dysfunctional. It's either internal, there's something wrong with it, or external, it's in the wrong environment. You might think, well, that's kind of all there is to say. But actually, it's not the only distinction we need. So something which I guess what you know, philosophers like to make things hard. So John and I got very excited when we discovered that there were more phenomena than being broken or being in the wrong environment. So let's distinguish between being in an abnormal environment, where I've omitted the capital N, which is silly, um, being in an abnormal environment and being in an inhospitable environment. So here's a phenomenon we're all familiar with. We've got a flower, plant, um, and this plant uh, exhibits adaptive phenotypic plasticity in the form of early flowering in response to stress. Okay? So here I am. I really would like to grow a bit longer, but given the conditions that I'm under, that's probably going to result in me not setting seed at all. So I flower early and small, and I set seed, and I don't have as many seeds as I would have had if I'd lived in a better environment. Now, in that case, the relevant parts, systems in this plant, are performing exactly the function for which they were designed by natural selection, and they're doing that in exactly the environment in which they were selected. Nevertheless, you'd really be missing something if you looked at this is like, say, I don't people know Sonia Sultan's really cool work on this kind of stuff. Um, if you, you know, you've got a whole bunch of plants in one of her greenhouses, and you didn't include the fact that these guys have successfully implemented the best available strategy, and these guys have gone for a second best strategy, and they've only gone for that because the alternative is dying on the way to following the best strategy. Okay, so you didn't reckon that these guys are in a a rich, a good environment, they've had a successful life cycle, and these guys have adopted a second best strategy because they're in an adverse, inhospitable, hostile environment. There's a, things have gone really well for this guy here with lots of seeds, not so well for the little stunted guy here with a few seeds. Okay? Um, so that's, and of course, it's, they're all controversial and, and slightly horrible, but there's plenty of phenomena in human health that fit into this box. Then the really, I wonder if anybody philosophers is going to get excited about this one, um, is a category we call heuristic failure. So the example that most people here will know is predictive adaptive response, as a let's call it a hypothesis in Gluckman's work. But it, it's a phenomenon you get throughout nature. So here's a butterfly doing the same thing, right? Um, animals are continually making choices under uncertainty, and plants, organisms. They're continually having to switch to a different developmental strategy can be a behavior as well, but let's think about development. Switch to a developmental strategy based on imperfect information. Okay, so they, I mean, if you decided I won't decide which uh, genes to switch on or off and which um, developmental pathway to go down until there's no chance that I'm wrong about which environment I'm going to be in when I'm an adult, then you know, you're probably just going to die, right? 
So you have cues in the environment, you pick up those cues and you respond and you drive this response, right? There's no point, you know, saying to a Daphnia um, embryo, you know, should you be armored or not? Let's just wait till we see a kind of little stickleback swimming up to us, right? That'll, then we'll know that we need armor. That's not gonna work, okay? You gotta do it in the egg. So um, there's no mechanism failure in a case like this. You're in the no environment, big N normal environment. And there are two cases, but let's just think about the one where it's also a hospitable environment. It's a nice environment, it's benign. You're using a heuristic decision rule. It's got a predictable error rate. So a significant number of these organisms will mismatch to their environment. They will do less well than other organisms, although they, even if they've, they've used an optimal decision rule in a benign environment for which they were specifically designed, there's a predictable rate with which they will do less well than some other organisms because they have to use a heuristic rule with a, with a predictable error rate. It's kind of straightforward, but we don't often think about that. But in fact, if you think about it, um, in the context of developmental origins of health and disease research, there's a lot of pathology out there that's down to heuristic failure. Okay, um, just a little subtle way, a way to make that distinction a bit clearer. Um, in an inhospitable environment, the mechanism is maximizing actual fitness. It's not possible for the little stunted plant to have any more seeds by trying to get any bigger. It's just going to die. Um, but the maximum achievable in that environment is a low maximum. And that's the sense in which little plant does worse than big plant. Um, on the other hand, in heuristic failure, the mechanism is maximizing expected fitness. In the hospitable environment, it's maximizing expected fitness compared to anyone else in the population. Okay? But the realized fitness, the actual fitness, can fall far short of what's achievable because the maximization strategy is to use a heuristic decision rule with a predictable error rate. So your actual fitness is lower than it might have been. And some other guy gets lucky. You, know, you both throw the craps and one of you wins. Um, and they've done much better than you. Okay. Okay. Um, I put a, um, there have been a lot of people making jokes about clinical relevance this week, so I thought I was entitled to a joke about clinical relevance. Um, so, uh, is there any clinical relevance? Um, we've discussed four kinds of biological normativity. Uh, four ways in which we, if we omit a better or worse dimension from a biological description, we're not failing to import our values, we're failing to adequately describe the biology. We're missing facts about what's happening out there if we don't include that better or worse dimension. Now, many of the things I've talked about would not be described as diseased organisms or as having a disease. I would argue that all of the cases I've talked about are highly relevant, and this is, I think, the way that um, someone like Randy would have talked about it in the past. They're highly relevant to understanding why the phenomena that we refer to as pathology is out there. Okay, so they're all ways of thinking. They're certainly all ways in which organisms are abnormal in some way, and abnormal in a way that puts them below other organisms. Okay, they're in, a, in a, some kind of a better, worse spectrum. And that's all relevant to under, they're all relevant to understanding why there's pathology. And I guess for me, the bottom line, one way to think about this, which maybe Kangian would like, is all four could form part, all four of these phenomena, describing what's going on, understanding that bit of the biology, could form part of a defeasible case for therapeutic intervention. I say defeasible, because there might be often you have, um, you say, that's a biologically abnormal trait, and somebody says, yes, but here are the relevant considerations, we're not going to intervene. There's all sorts of reasons. I think nobody in philosophy of medicine thinks you can get, uh, should we intervene as a direct inevitable consequence of is it pathological? Paul, please. Because as you've been talking, one word kept coming to my mind, and that is hobbit. Oh. <laughs> Are you prepared to say anything about the controversy surrounding Homo floresiensis, where it was microencephaly in, in hmm. the uh, or whether these were simply uh, evolved, um, diminutive right. I'm not prepared to say, sorry. Yeah, so Paul's asking, um, there's a controversy, and we love this controversy in Australia because um, there are at least three 
universities in Australia who claim the guy on the team that discovered Homo floresiensis as being a faculty member and put it on their websites. Um, same guy, you know, you can get a long way, share yourself out. Um, and uh, also we have a, some really great people uh, discovering, uh, I was once at a paleontology conference and a very aggressive young postdoc from New Zealand um, said the following thing, it was, uh, uh, of course, people say there's no, I can't do the Kiwi accent, I have to, have to get rid of my vowels. Um, people say there's no uh, um, fossils, there's no fossil evidence. When what they mean is there's no fossil evidence in the Northern Hemisphere. All right. So um, this is to a room of guys who are all the senior guys in his field. It was very kind of on the nose. Um, so, and of course, all from the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, so uh, we've got a whole bunch of other guys who think they're discovering really interesting early hominin species in places that people haven't looked before. Um, it's a big thing. So the question is, uh, some people say Homo floresiensis is just a bunch of malformed humans. It's not a new species or a subspecies. It's like digging up a leper colony or something like that, right? It's, you're not actually getting um, any human variation. I have no opinion on that because I've heard uh, really, I mean, I've listened to paleontologists who know far more about it than I do, rejecting that view strongly. And I entire, But I don't know whether they're, you know, I'd have to you know, it's like, I'm not going to work out what the consensus is in parallel. But I do have one strong view, which would be very controversial amongst, if applied, generally thinking about human beings, which is that it's a scientific question whether or not Homo floresiensis was a, uh, a subspecies or some, even an ecotype, perhaps. There are many different categories you can use to understand human variation which have different roles in, in evolutionary theory. Um, it's an objective scientific question whether that's right. It's not a question of uh, would insert name of some human society be prepared to accommodate Homo floresiensis and ensure that their quality of life was adequate. That's a really great important. I mean, of course, you know, if, if there were lots of living Homo floresiensis, we would have a major issue about ensuring that these, you know, hominins were properly treated and their rights were respected and that they had a good quality of life and that would be really important. But it's just not the same question as whether they're an ecotype or a subspecies or whatever, right? Um, and that's a controversial view and I don't think it should be a controversial view. You shouldn't mix those two up. Absolutely, yeah, and a very controversial one. Um, I think one of the reasons that people don't like the claim that they're just deformed is that it seems somehow, you know, disrespectful as opposed to right, which is kind of the wrong reason. Okay, I mean, I totally agree there's some of that going on in that debate. Um, okay, so something which interests me very much is that if you think about some of those cases that I was talking about earlier, so let me just come back. To, no, I won't because it take too much time. Um, let's think about those latter two cases. In the case of mechanism failure, we, the obvious thing to do is to fix the mechanism if you can. Okay, the case of mismatch, you think you know we should try and improve the environment so that normal human beings function effectively in the environment, right? Um, uh, what about inhospitable environment? Should we intervene to change the organism or the environment? And the interesting thing is, if we're going to intervene, they're going to have to intervene to fix both. It's no good. So if you've got uh, somebody who has um, insane, crazy high levels of stress reactivity, and you say, your trouble is, you know, your stress levels are through the roof. I think we're going to drug you and get them down. We're going to deal with your stress levels. And this kid is, is, is fighting for the Lord's Resistance Army in Uganda. You are not doing them a favor. Okay? That is not an improvement in their quality of life to be moved in, to be given a phenotypically, sorry, move their, their range of phenotypic plasticity to give them a phenotype that's very, very badly matched to their environment. Even though it's a terrible environment, okay? Um, so you've got to change both. If you actually want to intervene to improve this person's health, you need to fix the environment and you need to fix the stress system, okay? Um, and in the case of heuristic failure, well, if it's heuristic failure in a, uh, a poor environment, then we might very well think, well, you know, um, you're living in a really poor environment, you're adapted for a really rich environment, Actually, the thing to do is to fix the environment, and then you'll be a fully, you'll be a, the big, tall, flourishing plant with lots of seeds, instead of trying to be the big, full, tall, flourishing plant in the dry patch without enough sunlight and dying before you set seed. You've got to fix the environment. But suppose the heuristic mechanism has gone wrong in a very uh, good environment, and so I'm growing as a little stunted, early flowering plant, 
in a rich environment with lots of water and sunlight, then you want to fix me. You want to get in there and you know, put a bunch of microRNAs and get me growing fast. Okay? And that's what's going to produce the desirable situation. So what I think is really interesting here is that you normally think of, is this organism healthy, as a question that can be addressed by just focusing on the organism. But in fact, from a developmental origins of health and disease perspective, asking whether an organism is a good state of health is a question that you can't address without considering the organism's environment. So in fact, the thing which you can make healthier if you take these phenomena to be relevant to health is an organism environment system. Okay, now I think lots of people think that's important at a, and lots of discussion of you know, one health concepts and so on. But I guess what I'm getting at is that if we kind of push the concept of pathology in the direction that evolutionary thinking seems to be pushing us, it's going to be the case that it's the very idea of what it is to be healthy or in a state of pathology is going to be linked to the idea of organisms and their environments as linked match systems, organism environment systems. OK, so conclusions. Um, pathology should be held hostage to evolutionary inquiry. It's going to deepen our distinction of our understanding of the distinction if we bring evolutionary thinking in. It shouldn't be held hostage to whether it's intuitive to call something a disease. And I'm obviously not the first person uh, to argue that. Developmental origins pro uh, um, approaches to pathology show us that there's the selected effects account, perfectly sensible core idea in modern synthesis evolutionary thinking, etc. There's a lot more to biological normativity than failing to do what you were designed to do. Okay. Um, and they also imply, and I think this is um, perhaps the most clinically interesting idea here, that the health of organisms and environments are conceptually as well as causally independent. Okay, so thank you. Questions? Mm. Mm. We do ask people to use the mic so it gets on camera. All right, thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, I'm going to try and come to Tim Lewin's defense, although I don't know his specific reasons. So one reason I might imagine not holding pathology hostage to evolution is because of the uncertainty of our ability to know evolutionary facts, and also because uh, we might end up making radically different judgments about the acceptability of treatment um, that could flip back and forth to, as new discoveries come online. So that would sort of be a reason to say, it might be interesting to know about evolution when it comes to pathology, but at least in the context of human medicine, we should certainly hold them at least at arm's length due to uh, epistemic problems with our knowledge of evolution. Yeah, Beckett, that's really sensible. I mean, I, I would I'd just say, look, I agree with epistemic arm's length. I would apply something like what Phil Kitch has argued here. It's a risk-benefit analysis. I mean, if, you know, I, I read stuff all the time. I read it, I think that's brilliant. That's great science. And you would be mad to base policy on it. Right? Wait a long time until the paradigm's matured and we've tested it 50 different times. And, you know, think of all the great ideas you've heard of in psychology that were really good ideas. It was great work. That was a beautiful paper. And, you know, 10 years later, we don't believe it. So I totally agree with that. Um, but on the other hand, you know, uh, for example, um, you know, attitudes to various, I mean, I think, uh, it ought to be the case that thinking more about uh, human biology ought to move. If we once we when we really think that we've got a grip on something, it ought to actually challenge our existing ideas about who's ill and who's well. Okay, so you know if somebody comes along and presents a theory about something like handedness, um, which says, "Look, this I've got here's even more reason for thinking that this is part of just normal Darwinian variation." You know, here's the stuff on all that wonderful stuff that Corbett did on crows, you know, handedness in crows and all that, right? You know, you find this everywhere in nature. It seems to be sitting at, um, you know, particular kind of balanced rates, and we can talk about why that is. And, you know, and that's a good reason for not forcing kids to write with their right hand. So, but I totally agree. I mean, I think that's just part of, uh, you know, a sensible set of ideas that you can actually find in, in some contemporary uh, philosophy of science work about how the difference between what is worth spending research money on, what's worth um, you know, taking really seriously, embedding your career on investigating, and then a, for important traits, it's a lot further before we base public policy on it. So entirely agree. <laughs>
But Paul, one of the most disturbing things to me about an evolutionary view of health is that natural selection doesn't shape us for health, it shapes us for maximum reproduction. Mm -hmm. And there are cases where natural selection shapes us to do things that are bad for mm -hmm. our health, longevity, and everything else. Mm -hmm. Where does this fit into a philosopher's view of what's disease? Well, I think it actually, um, so I do think that this way, that pursuing these lines of, of thinking is genuinely disruptive. I think it's a real problem for the idea that there is a single ideal endpoint, which is, you know, the perfectly healthy human being. Um, it's all trade-offs, and we all know that. I mean, so some of the research that, that's going on at CPC, I mean, one of the things that's really clear is, do you want to, uh, you know, if you, you're talking about diets, do you want a diet that will make you healthy through the lifespan, or do you want maximum longevity? Because they ain't the same thing. Maximum reproduction. <laughs> or certainly maximum reproduction, yeah. Um, but, you know, I mean, all of us would like to live a long time and to be in really good physiological health. But actually, they don't have the same optimum. Um, and why would they, for life history reasons? So trade-offs are a real problem. The other thing is, of course, you know, there's a lot more phenotypic plasticity out there than we used to appreciate. And a lot of it, you know, is not, you know, I used to have a joke, you know, Tr the traditional view of human health is that every fertilized egg is either trying to become the Venus de Milo or the Apollo Belvedere, depending on which chromosomes it has, right? That is not true. These things are facing a series of flexible choices relative to the kind of environments. Um, and they're engaging in various kind of ranking with other organisms in the group, which will be different strategies, all the stuff that's pretty well understood. So the very idea of being in perfect health, I think, is a real problem. Instead, what I think is we need points at which understanding the biology can inform our decision with whether this is something that we should be intervening to fix. And a notion of an organism doing well, which is richer than a single endpoint. Yeah, it's, yeah, I don't in any, in any sense claim to have the answer to that because that's, as it were, the whole research program. Yeah. Time for one or two more questions possibly here. And not so much a question as sort of an observation, since we have a little time, it appears. Um, I can see three possible reasons for this kind of intellectual exercise. I'm a little skeptical about the whole function of philosophy. Um, so one is defining disease for human beings, right? Do we feel it's necessary to intervene or not? Mm. For example, in an extreme case, I can remember growing up that left-handedness was considered to be an abnormality mm -hmm. in my community. And when children started showing left-handedness in infancy, parents forcefully tried to get mm -hmm. them to become right-handed. Uh, clearly, that's you know something that might have been seen as abnormal. You wouldn't call it a disease, but it's a problem. The second, of course, would be for uh, animal health. Mm -hmm. You know, how do we treat uh, animals with disease? And the third would be for environmental intervention, since uh, we're entirely in control of the environment these days. If we see environmental mismatches in uh, plants and animals, do we consciously intervene to control uh, or change mm -hmm. the environment, something like that? Mm -hmm. So, um, do you have any reaction to that, I guess? Yeah, that's... well, the last one sounds more like what my colleagues who do philosophy of ecology write about. And I think there's a whole bunch of other issues there about how we think about normatively about states of the environment. Um, and they're, they're slightly different issues. I mean, um, they're not entirely unrelated. I mean, there's the big issue of, uh, um, you know, what are we actually trying to do in, in conserving environments? Okay, so, you know, there's a traditional approach, which is that there's some notion of a, a stable, enduring, pristine state, and we're trying to put them back to that. I don't think that has much credibility in ecological theory. It seems to be the import of a pre-scientific idea, and that's then used, used to frame doing some serious science, which is a bad way to do things. Um, then there's the notion of, you know, in many of countries like this country or Australia, of putting it back to the way it was the day the first people got off the boat, which is a pretty weird ideal to spend a lot of public money on. Okay, um, And then there are more interesting ideas like maximizing the preservation of one of the many operationalizations of biodiversity. There's, I think, a wonderful philosophy of literature on the relation between the many operationalizations of biodiversity and various theoretical understandings of biodiversity that ecologists fight about, and how you might 
be rationally try to proceed when you're still beating yourself up about what the construct is you're trying to operationalize. Okay, um, so I think that's a slightly different area, and a bunch of other people that work on that. Um, with respect to the other two, I mean, um, you know, I I very strongly don't believe there's a big. There, there are plenty of people I know and have a lot of intellectual respect for who think that you know theoretical biology as an activity is a waste of time. You know, you say papers in JTB and oh, well, you're not interested then, right? I'm not going to read that. Um, uh, and you know, what I do is philosophy of biology is just one stage more up the kind of let's get conceptual and reflective and think about foundations than what theoretical biology guys do. In fact, some of our stuff gets published in theoretical biology journals. We don't see a sharp line between that. Um, and there's stuff in, you know, some people who do, as it were, the, um, you know, the metaphysics of some of these issues. I have a similar attitude to. I think they floated off into the land of the fairies, right? As David Hume wrote, what is that great? We've, we are got into fairyland long ere we conclude our deduction, was his, on his views of Berkeley, I think. Um, so, you know, um, I think work just stands for itself. If you, you actually read the papers, it looks useful. If you read the papers and people seem to be just, you know, talking, using unanchored language in a way that's for their little in-group, then yeah, it's a waste of space. But I hope a lot of what we do in philosophy of biology is more useful than that. So we, so we have a very large social insect group here at ASU. Mm -hmm. So you know, I have a lot of questions about social insects. And sometimes you think, you think about things like uh, cordyceps, you know, you know, fungus that infects an individual insect, mm -hmm. and then that insect leaves the colony and you know, in one narrative, it's 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 doing something that's of positive fitness to the cordyceps, and in another narrative, it's leaving the colony. And um, and I guess I'm I'm sort of wondering if you thought about you know, sort of these organisms that are not membrane bound, where mm -hmm. inclusive fitness oh, yeah. certainly is driving mm -hmm. the group. Um, where is pathology defined? Is it defined yeah. at an individual level, mm -hmm. at a group level? I mean, it sort of yeah. how does do you, how do you modulate what you've said? I've got a completely useless, but I think precise, one-line answer to that. If we had a serious solution to thinking about what are the, the units of evolutionary change, then every individual of a unit of evolutionary change would be associated with a life history strategy, and that would be the thing that it's failing to optimize or failing to follow in some way. Um, so when you're dealing with something, I mean, I'm really interested in what do we say about, um, you know, uh, um, pathology in uh, fetally derived cells found in a mother after 10 years, right? Do we, do we kind of regard them as pathological if they're not, they don't have an optimal gene expression profile for where they are at that time from the mother's point of view? Or do we actually think of them as part of the extended phenotype of the fetus? I think that's an empirical question. It's partly a question about saying, what are the gene expression patterns? What are the optima? And what are the control? How are those gene expression patterns being set? So I think that's actually right. Um, there's some really nice work being done by a um, woman uh, philosopher in the uh, UK called Elseling Kingma, arguing that you know, when you get serious about the biology, um, you should regard really early stages of the fetus as strictly a part of the mother. Because if what you're interested in is in whose interest is this stuff going on? Okay, for the first few cell divisions, it looks like it's entirely still being driven by. So I think absolutely right. You bring in you know, our best current way of deploying genetics and multi-level selection theory. You try and work out what are the units here, and then you try and understand this, I think, really interesting relationship between evolutionary units and physiological units. And hopefully that will hang together in such a way that we'll be able to say something reasonably coherent about, is there a physiological unit which could be said to be either following its strategy successfully or not? Um, but it's hard, and it's hard because the biology is, you know, what's the, um, uh, you know, there's every time you think, every time, so because the space of possible things that biology actually does is much bigger than the space of possibilities we can imagine before we start studying it, which makes it really hard to kind of say anything very concrete until the phenomena are in. Yeah.
We should wrap up in just a minute, but as we do, I'd like to give you one more chance to talk about how valuable philosophy can be, <laughs> if you think it is, uh, for evolutionary medicine in particular, because I have hopes that there are going to be opportunities for collaborations between his center in Sydney mm -hmm. and our center here. We're going to have a discussion about that immediately following, on, and everyone, not just members of our center who might be interested in uh, talking about those possibilities is welcome to stay. But for So what good can philosophy do for evolutionary medicine and vice versa, Paul. Yeah, um, I've, I've got a mic, it's okay. Yeah, so look, I mean, I'm hoping that, uh, it seems to me that at the moment, uh, and I don't, th I don't think this is a, um, a, not meant to be a dismissive comment, but if you look at what get, gets called the philosophy of medicine, most of it is at the intersection of metaphysics and ethics. So philosophers in the room, if that seems about right. Um, so you pick up a philosophy of medicine journal, and there are a whole bunch of people who are doing really kind of close to the science, embedded philosophy of biology, who don't focus on medicine. And I think if people who were doing things like worrying about units of selection, worrying about uh, you know whether or not the holobiont concept really makes sense, what would be ev what would what's at stake? What would it really take to show that the holobiont concept is valuable or not valuable? And there's really good work going on on that. Um, I think if those guys could move their attention to more to the biomedical sciences and to be, you know, away from, uh, uh, you know, core evolution stuff, um, then I think they'd make the same contribution that I think some of those guys have made to things like debates over unit selection. So in the same way, I think philosophers have done really useful work in things like clarifying the interpretation of Fisher's fundamental theorem which is not obvious, and it's an entirely conceptual issue. I mean, the maths, everybody understands the maths. What does that maths mean? Um, and how do you relate it to the phenomena of evolution, the stuff we're actually talking about? Um, and I think in stuff like that brought in the kind of close to the ground, you know, kind of trying to actually, you know, participate in foundational theoretical debates in a way that moves things forward um, could actually have the same sorts of benefit for biomedicine. And the other thing I think is that we could open up a lot of those discussions of ethical and social issues to being much more richly informed and realizing that effectively you're, there's not much point in working out the correct ethical stance towards a popular representation of the science because that's not how things are. Okay, um, And actually the real science typically poses all sorts of really nasty, tough problems which aren't there. Okay, um, And so I think you know, if we, there's a sense in which philosophy moved into that mode could create a perhaps a more productive and healthy relationship between, you know, cutting edge scientific discovery, controversial and problematic, though many of them are. In fact, that's part of the reason why we need a bit of interpretation. Um, and on the other hand, you know, the classic kind of LC stuff. So, you know, I think there's a real problem when, uh, you know, those two things are, well, you guys tell us the facts and we, we'll LC about it. They need to be much more intimately linked up. And I think philosophy can be a pretty good mediator there. So with that, we'll wrap up. Thanks, everyone, for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.